Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third edition of the Professor's Podcast. And it gives me, and I'm not just saying it this time, great pleasure to welcome Barry Spur to the show. Barry, how are you? Very well, Salvatore. Lovely to see you again. I love your fez. <laughs> I love my fez, too. <laughs> and the audience does as well. At least I've only had positive comments from the audience on the fez. I'm disappointed not to see you in full academic regalia. That's oh, how I, I you. I'm so I, uh, I, I'm humbly dressed. <laughs> with, with, with a mitre. Yeah. <laughs> Waterboard next time. <laughs> You've got it. It's a deal. We are, uh, of course, both of us, um, you know, are affiliated with the University of Sydney, but we're not here to talk about the University of Sydney today. We're here to talk about academic freedom more broadly and cancel culture more broadly. And I'd like to start out with an article you published in Quadrant. Both of us write actively for Quadrant. I should point out Barry is the poetry editor of Quadrant, but uh, he had a piece in Quadrant in the January, February issue. I will go ahead and share it. Now, here we go. You wouldn't read about it. And this is the Quadrant Online version. It's also in the January, February edition of the print magazine. And uh, this article is about cancel culture. It starts off with uh, Alex Zielinski, who's the vice chancellor at Newcastle University. Um, a response he made in Quadrant to an article about the genocide map and the corrections to the genocide map that had been made in quadrants. This has been a back and forth. But um, a, a lot of this article is really about the fact that universities, instead of necessarily looking to get at the bottom of things, you know, trying to find the, you know, the, there is, <laughs> as I think was, was it, was Matthew Arnold, the best there is and right. um, yeah, the out to us, uh, it, are increasingly just looking to protect reputations to, you know, prevent controversies. And of course, this leads to a kind of cancel culture. And you uh, do write about the case of Professor Kathleen Stock, formerly of University of Sussex, and now I hear University of Austin, is that the place? Yes, uh, she's uh, uh, become a kind of honorary fellow there at this uh, newly established place. You've got to be careful, it's the University of Austin uh, in Texas, not the University of Texas at Austin, which is, right. uh, you would know better than I would, it's our long established place. And it's, um, uh, it prides itself being, on being a place uh, that uh, where witches uh, a welcome who don't burn. And uh, so uh, <laughs> Kathleen Stock is obviously a witch who doesn't burn. And uh, <laughs> she says that she's um, uh, happy to accept this honorary fellowship, but it's more really just giving her name to the place. I, I mean, I don't think she's moving to Texas. And I don't think it's an employed right. position. It's just showing her support for a place that is trying to return to what university should be. And that is a place for uh, free discussion of anything and everything. And uh, the way she was treated at Sussex, of course, is, uh, well, globally notorious now. So, what actually happened in that incident? Well, it was a case of her, she's a professor of uh, feminist studies and philosophy, essentially a philosopher, but with a prime interest in feminist studies. And uh, she made the controversial statement uh, not the first to make this statement, but uh, she made it, that uh, uh, male to female transsexual people are not real women. And uh, as a result... I don't even think she said... Did she even say not real women, or did she just say oh, are, well, uh, are not it women? Might be in the, uh, well, well, I mean, the inference was that they, they weren't right. a deal right. or something, which, uh, curiously, and I point this out in the article, echoes something that uh, Jermaine Greer said some several years ago and for which she was cancelled at Cambridge. And as a result of this, immediately there was this eruption and uh, trans students at Sussex, so you'd wonder how many there would be, but uh, perhaps there's a large trans community in Sussex, said that this made them feel unsafe. And uh, Kathleen Stock's immediate response to this, which is the response that uh, any academic would make, I imagine, in such a situation was that this was an issue that um, she was happy to discuss and debate uh, with the students, but they would have none of it. And uh, some of them even uh, resorted to chasing her with flares. I don't know if they were imagining they were going to put her on, set her on fire when they caught her. But uh, anyway, she said she was subjected, it's a good phrase, to a process of medieval ostracism, and she resigned. 
Well, and there might be legitimate concerns about violence in, in today's atmosphere. I mean, again, I'm going to go back to that Sky News article, and uh, they're reporting that when she came to campus, she found, quote, the walls were plastered with posters, each one screaming my name in bold capital letters. Later that day, I saw an Instagram account titled Kathleen Stock is a homophobe. Uh, it showed Balaclava wearing figures brandishing flares and saying Stock out. Uh, you know, she was, uh, it sounds like, legitimately worried for her safety at the oh, University yes. of Oh, she definitely was, as uh, Jermaine Greer was. I don't want to go back to something that's a few years ago, but it's uh, such a similar situation because uh, after Jermaine was denied an honorary degree at Cambridge because of saying exactly the same thing, her college had a vote and voted her down for the honorary degree for which she'd been proposed. She also had an invitation to go to Harvard University, Cardiff University in Wales to give a lecture. And uh, they said they couldn't guarantee her physical safety there. So Jermaine said, well, you know, I'm getting a little bit old for this. She said, she said I'm 76. I don't want to go down there and uh, have things thrown at me and be screamed at and what have you. So um, uh, and it's, I think she <laughs> said in a typical Jermaine way, um, well, you know, it's not all that interesting or rewarding, so I'm not going. And um, I mean, this is the this is the nonsense. And I did use the phrase, the, the good old Aussie phrase, rat baggery, a uh, kind of vicious rat baggery that uh, uh, campuses have descended to in as a result of this kind of cancel culture. I did want to point out, uh, Sal, if you don't mind, just uh, as a footnote mm -hmm. stage, that uh, of course, if you look back in history. People have been cancelled before. This is not just a contemporary phenomenon. And a well-known example, who, if you like, was cancelled twice, uh, was Bertrand Russell. Uh, oh, really? Yes. Oh, I didn't know yeah. that. He was cancelled uh, during the First World War uh, from Cambridge. He had to. He was thrown out of his fellowship there because, as he was then, and as he was, of course, through his very long life, a very strong a pacifist and was arguing against the involvement in the war as a pacifist would at that time. So he, he was uh, dismissed from his fellowship, I think, at Trinity, but I'm not sure, anyhow, at Cambridge. And then I think it was also during wartime, the Second World War, he was in New York on a visiting professorship. I can't remember which university. I somehow think it was the City University of New York, but it doesn't matter, one of them. And um, uh, a mother wrote to the university authorities, very concerned about her daughter, who was at the campus uh, because uh, Professor Russell was uh, notorious for his advocacy and his practice of free love. And uh, this lady felt that her daughter's moral uh, status was in considerable danger having a <laughs> chap on the campus. And as Professor Russell points out in his autobiography, not only was the girl not in his classes, he was teaching mathematical logic. That was the purpose <laughs> of his visit. <laughs> and the chance of her moral rectitude being assailed, oh. and of her not being in the class and being in a class of uh, mathematical logic was pretty uh, slim. But the authorities got rid of him. Well, there was a piece in Quadrant on uh, Foucault's uh, sexual, um, uh, I think peccadillos is too mild a word for it, uh, yeah. but uh, maybe people do need to be worried. Um, look, I want to ask you more about uh, cancel culture and safe spaces, but first, as a professor of poetry, I have to ask you, is there an appropriate rhyme for rat baggery? Oh, I don't know. I've, I've always <laughs> thought that. Uh, a very dear friend of mine, Dr. Runcie, who may be watching this loves these as a Canadian would these Australian locutions and I, I'm pretty sure it's an Australian it's just an Australianism but I'm ready uh, to be corrected on that um, no I'm off the spur of the moment pardon me I can't <laughs> think of an of appropriate rhyme for it make a good limerick wouldn't it so it sounds like people like Professor Stark actually need a safe space and and I, I I'd like to contrast literal and figurative meaning of safe spaces because a lot of us who are free speech advocates desperately want universities to be literal safe spaces for speech, meaning that you can't get beaten up for your speech, you can't get shouted down for your speech, you, you can't get fired for your speech. You know, we want it to be a safe place where you can express yourself. But of, of course, that language of safe spaces has been given this you know twisted meaning of uh, safe for well i don't even know what it is exactly safe for people who might self-harm yeah. 
if and they people, were people who come with a sense uh, uh, or develop a sense of vulnerability. I mean, how safe, as I do ask in the article, how safe the space was it for Professor Stock, who was being pursued by fire? Uh, so, uh, I mean, the authorities go on about how important it is for the safety of the university, for the people there, but they don't care about the safety of the academics, for example, or of those students who might have countercultural points of view as they would be by today's cultural yeah. standards. Um, and the problem is, I was thinking naturally about all of this before we talked, one of the bad aspects of this is in the area of pedagogy, the area of teaching. I mean, the three domains of teaching, if uh, people are ever going to go back physically to campuses, I think they're starting to do, um, are the tutorial, the seminar and the lecture. And I mean, the best of those are places where there is the robust exchange of ideas that Professor of uh, the IC, VC of Newcastle talked about, but I don't know why he imagines that this is the case now. And uh, how can you and you and I, seasoned teachers, I mean, what kind of tutorial or seminar can you have where everybody either has the same point of view or people are frightened to say something, not only because it might be going against the grain, but because it might hurt someone's feelings. And seeing we're talking a bit about Quadrant, there's a very good piece by Raymond Burns on this cult of well-being in school, where there's this kind of, you know, you've got to be constantly sensitive to how you're feeling today. You know, are you okay at the moment? And will you be hurt if I mention that one of Conrad's short novels is The Nigger of the Narcissus? Is this going to you, you know? Well, I'm just stating a fact. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, in, in Shakespearean phrase, the rest is silence. Well, you know how hard, and I'm sure some listening may also know how hard it is to generate discussion in a tutorial or even a seminar, or even an honours seminar or a postgraduate seminar. Well, it must be even harder than ever if people feel that they've got to be very careful and be second guessing what other people in the room might feel if they express some outlandish view. I was always uh, grateful, actually, when someone would say something completely crazy. Uh, about something in a tutorial because at least she gave you something to talk about and see <laughs> the others were awake, yeah. you know, and we'd say, oh, no, that's a load of rubbish. You can't see the case. I mean, uh, we, we, we were always careful. I mean, you you were respectful for people and uh, right. and what have you. But I think that uh, uh, to use uh, that uh, vice chancellor's phrase, you know, the robustness uh, that has to be there if you're going to be engaged in what T.S. Eliot calls the common pursuit of true judgment. Well, you know, that can only happen if people are up front with their different views. You know, I have a bit of, of sympathy for Professor Zielinski because I know he's in a difficult place. I mean, I've heard him speak before. I do respect him a lot. He um, is in the position of defending his own indefensible faculty members. Uh, so he's defending his university and his faculty members against criticisms from outside. And so as an organization man, I guess, well, okay, that's kind of what he has to do. But on the other hand, he's shielding people who have been you know, clearly shown to have plagiarized, to have uh, misrepresented facts, to have uh, you know, resisted correcting misrepresentations of facts. I don't mean interpretations. You know, to read the documentation, mm. it's, it, well, the university itself in admitted that the criticisms were correct by quietly changing the texts <laughs> that were uh, criticized. And it, could you remind me of the person in, in who's written the piece in Quadrant, the piece oh, in Quadrant? I, no, I, I, I haven't been following that all that closely. I have to apologize, and I'm apologizing to you out there. Is, is it William Rubenstein? I think it is William Rubenstein. I've got the, um, uh, there's something here about it. Uh, uh, I, I think it's William Rubenstein who wrote it? the oh, pieces. Okay. Yes, I know it's been a, a debate that um, came backwards and forwards. If it's not, William forgive and writer forgive me. Uh, but the, um, you know, so on the one hand, I respect him for, you know, knowing he's got to stand up for his institution. On the other hand, well, you know, if, if, a, if a PhD student had plagiarized to the extent we in that genocide map, mm. that PhD student would be given a show cause hearing and be kicked out as a PhD student. Yet a professor gets defended by the vice chancellor in, in a public forum. So, 
you know, where do we come down on this? Should 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 vice chancellors be shielding their professors from criticism, even when that criticism is correct, mm -hmm. or should they be, you know, rooting out problems in their own universities, which is a, easy to say but much harder to do. Well, you speak yourself, of course, Sal, in your book about you know, can universities be reformed? And I think one of the problems that has happened, uh, uh, I don't know the extent to which this has happened in America in, uh, and in England and elsewhere, but is the way in which uh, universities have been uh, reconceived and re-understood, if I can use that beautiful word, uh, as businesses and uh, as students as customers. And uh, that you know that this sort of corporate model seems to have dominated, and uh, one rather yearns for the time. And there are, of course, vice chancellors that fall into this category, and the vice chancellor of Newcastle is one of them. Uh, for uh, academics who are uh, vice chancellors, rather than people who seem to have principally a uh, business kind of background and business priorities, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I mean, you know, there's the old saying, those who can do, those who can't teach, and those who can't teach become vice-chancellors. <laughs> uh, I, I wasn't aware of corollary. <laughs> I, I just feel that uh, uh, the idea of the university has been produced in so many ways. And, the, you know, I mean, of course, they have to be run as businesses. No one's denying that to a certain extent. But uh, one just wishes that uh, those in charge would stand up more for academic principles and the idea of the university and the human-like uh, ideal. Now, I, I have to thank Barry. Barry, for uh, plugging my book, All as Universities, Can They Reform? Uh, Barry, if you don't already have a copy, I would be thrilled to send you a copy. So uh, just let me know well, after, must the, review it in after the show. Oh, well, fantastic. I didn't know. That's great. Uh, I hope you enjoy the book. Uh, Anthony Carr has uh, said... questions and comments here. Freedom, yeah, well, I'll read it out. Freedom and complete safety are incompatible. But then he asks the question, are people being cancelled because those doing the cancelling are themselves at war? I'm not quite sure what that might mean, but uh, Anthony, but uh, certainly uh, there are some strange what you would have thought would have been bedfellows who are now at one another's throats. And that is uh, the feminists and the trans lobby. It's uh, strange, you know. I, I, I mean, you would have thought uh, that people like Kathleen Stock and Germaine Greer, uh, Germaine is very much in the libertarian tradition, uh, would have been uh, supporters of this. And as she says herself in the famous interview that's online, uh, that she's not uh, uh, prohibiting, attempting, why would she be attempting to prohibit people making that change? She's just expressing the opinion right. that they don't become real women uh, as, a, as a result of it. And she sees it as deeply misogynistic and what have you. So it's interesting that, that these two groups of people, if you like, feminists and those in favour of the uh, the whole transsexual process and what have you, and transsexual rights, which we would have seen as both on the radical edge of uh, cultural thought and uh, and academic uh, research and what have you, are turning on one another. And uh, right. so, uh, I, if that might be what Anthony's suggesting there, um, uh, yeah. that would be, I suppose, this would be proof of it that um, someone like Stock and someone like Greer, uh, they have been cancelled by um, the trans lobby. It's interesting, though, isn't it? I mean, uh, just that this is uh, such a small minority, I assume, of the human race, mm -hmm. and yet it seems to be um, ramifying in the consequences of its activism uh, right around the world. Well, well, we should be clear, this is not just about uh, transsexual activism. Oh, no. it, it's, you know, cancel culture is a, mm -hmm. a strategy used broadly, whether it's by, uh, you know, the anti-Israel BDS campaigners, by uh, climate catastrophism uh you know this is a, a broad tactic not not related to one specific oh, no, no it's, just, it's just that this one comes into prominence right I can't remember the lady's surname but joe someone or other also in england also uh, at the open university she's been kicked out of that just in the last few weeks for expressing again the same kind of uh, view but the 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 go-to word for abuse of people which can even be used in the areas of discussion of climate change and what have you is of course racism so someone's a racist i mean you know, the, the term is just applied as a kind of blanket term of abuse even when the issue mightn't be specifically one to do with race so uh, right. uh you know it's a it, it it's 
it's a weaponizing of thought and uh, punishing. And the difference between the Bertrand Russell kind of situation is that though he did have a double cancellation, though they didn't use that term then, um, he went on, of course, to have a world famous career. And I suppose I'm not a philosopher, but I think many would say he's one of the greatest philosophers of the 20th century, certainly one of the most influential. Uh, whereas now this cancel culture cancels you for life. Right. Uh, and uh, with the um, internet and we, it's got its advantages, as we're finding out today, I hope, uh, uh, that's cancellation in eternum. I mean, mm -hmm. beyond the grave, uh, you are cancelled and your reputation <laughs> is tattered, uh, all because of perhaps just a casual phrase. I mean, with Russell, of course, he was no doubt writing pamphlets and books and what have you on those issues, which we mentioned earlier, but uh, now just a casual phrase in a lecture or in a tutorial or a seminar or a meeting. Well, can be the, of John, the, the gray. There's a hilarious little clip. I, I happen to, to um, watch the clip of uh, Donald Trump doing a an interview in 2017, a press conference regarding the Charlottesville Unite the Right rally, at which uh, one uh, one counter protester was killed and many severely injured by a car ramming, yeah. uh, you know, car ramming act, which was labeled act, an act of um, of hatred, and the the person who did it clearly was a you know, a white supremacist neo-Nazi. Um, but Donald Trump was talking about it and he was trying, of all people, Donald Trump was trying to contextualize it saying, well, you know, these people want to cancel Robert E. Lee. You know, would they cancel you know, George Washington? He was a slave owner. And then he said to the reporter, he said, you know, do you support Thomas Jefferson? And the reporter said, you know, yes, of course, you know, but that's, the, and, and Donald Trump, well, he's a slave owner. And the reporter added, but no one's talking about canceling Thomas Jefferson. We're mm -hmm. talking about the leader, uh, a Confederate general. Fast forward four years, the Thomas Jefferson statue <laughs> has also been removed yeah, in, yeah. In, in Richmond, Virginia. Yeah. And, you know, well, yeah, you know, four years ago, you, you couldn't imagine. No, Donald Trump is just being Donald Trump by you know, raising this issue. And, well... You know, Jefferson's gone now too. Yes, it's a, the terms that are used are very interesting too. This phrase, hate speech, which uh, is immediately put on as a label if somebody says something that you find offensive or something, they automatically are a hater. Well, I mean, they may not be, but it's that's the that's the phrase that's used. It's even in legislation, isn't it? Uh, uh, isn't there some legislation? Well, the ATD and, and and similar legislation in Canada, as an American, I, I find absolutely shocking. And it seems like, uh, you know, I know many of the people prosecuted under Section 18C, not, not technically prosecuted, uh, uh, fined under Section 18C in Australia has been relationship issues where, you know, two partners are having a fight and one calls the other an N-word or one calls the other, a, a, you know, a racial slur. And then this becomes a case before a hate speech tribunal. You know, it's, it just seems wildly disproportionate. I mean, I'm not saying anyone should use a racial slur in mm. talking to someone else, but. Mm. So the intention is always assumed to be the very worst intention. So even if there's, a, even if it's a, it's a jest, and we may say, well, you should avoid jests that are, the, are of that kind. But if it's said in jest, it wasn't intended in hate. And uh, it, it depends on who it was said to. Oh, no, speak. I would go further and say, context, even if it was context, said with hostile you know. intent as a racist statement, mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, it, it, it still doesn't raise to the level of the dignity of public policy, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I would suggest. I mean, you have to have a, you know, if, I mean, to, to go back to the academic environment, you know, if I, if there is a an academic who is, legitimately a sexist, a racist, a, uh, you know, transphobic, uh, Islamophobic, you know, if there's a press who has any of these things, um, well, I don't like that, but, you know, does that person have to lose their job? Does person have any other? It's not that the, the, the punishment is uh, totally out of kilter with the alleged crime. No. Um, going back to Jermaine again in that interview, uh, she said, this was the interviewer challenges, uh, you, know, you know, you make uh, transsexual people feel uncomfortable and, and everything. Right. And Jermaine replies, well, if I was uh, having a 
meeting with one or was in a situation where I was addressing one, I would use uh, the appropriate term like miss or ms or something for them if that's what they wanted. One respects them, one uses courtesy. Okay. But that doesn't mean to say that you should betray your principles in expressing an opinion about them. Well, As an intellectual, you feel you have a right to say, a duty uh, to say. I mean, many racists, uh, transphobia is a relatively new uh, issue in society, but you know, racism, sexism with us forever. Many racists and sexists, I'm sure, have been professors. Uh, should they preach racism and sexism from the pulpit? No, I, I think if a professor got up and was actually lecturing racism and sexism, that's reasonable grounds for disciplinary action and eventual dismissal if the person does not change that behavior. But if a physicist is a racist, should that person not be allowed to teach physics? Well, then I get to the question, well, should that person be allowed to work in a private company as a physicist? Should that person be allowed to work at Woolworths, stock keeping? You know, and if that person shouldn't be allowed to work anywhere, well, what do you do with that person, uh, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I think we have to have a, you know, we can control people's behavior in appropriate settings. I, mm -hmm. I mean, it, you know, if I, I mean, even in the case of the uh, of Professor Stock, if she were lecturing, if she were actually lecturing and used transphobic language, yeah. that is, if she actually said the words, yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm air quoting, I'm not saying mm. these words, mm. you know, trans women are not women. Mm. Well, that would be confrontational. Now, if she led a discussion on should uh, should transsexual women have the same rights as biologically born women in different situations? You know, entirely appropriate. Um, I, you know, I mean, I, I think that we have to have some sense of perspective that the moral test, well, you know, I mean, Cambridge and Oxford used to have moral tests. <laughs> they got rid of them. Uh, you know, thank moral you. Right? <laughs> I had a moral tutor. I never saw him. Maybe I should have. <laughs> um, the, uh, I mean, uh, I can remember in my Philosophy One lectures uh, uh, having very interesting lectures, which I found very challenging, uh, on uh, the existence of God. Hmm. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I think I mentioned this in the Quadrant article. I mean, I found every day in my undergraduate days I was being challenged about views that I thought I'd made up my mind about sure. very solidly when I was a teenager, as teenagers tend to do. Uh, and uh, this is what you came to university for. And I didn't feel that uh, that lecturer, quite the contrary, was a brilliant lecturer. I didn't feel that he was, um, uh, you know, a, a, a assaulting me or giving me hate speech and making it pretty clear as he went through the three or four traditional arguments for the existence of God that God didn't exist. I wasn't, I, I'm, I, he may have been a believer, he may not have been, it was pretty clear that he probably wasn't. That was my deduction. But, I mean, why wasn't I feeling unsafe? Right, um, and, and, and let's against a, a, a Christian believer. I mean, it's very selective. Uh, again, uh, what people find that they are offended by. Right, and let's be clear: in Pakistan, that could not only get you arrested; it could get you executed for blasphemy. Well, exactly. uh, we, do we really want to be that sort of culture? Look, I have to get to some of the chats. Christopher Carr says, uh, cancel culture is, can, has to continue canceling forever. It can never reach a point of stasis. Even the practitioners of cancel culture risk being canceled further down the road. And I think, Christopher, yeah. that's very much in the tradition of the revolution uh, like, like to Saturn, the revolution eats its children. Uh, Barry, can we just sit back and wait for the revolution to eat its children? Well, uh, I mean, talking of children, uh, this is a huge issue in the schools as well. Uh, I mean, uh, this uh, whole situation where uh, a generation of children are being taught that they must say certain things. And of course, in their young years, they uh, don't have the confidence uh, uh, to uh, answer back in that course and they're learning these things for the first time and what have you and uh, Keith Winshuttle has written a piece I think it's in that quadrant or the recent one about how they're being taught to hate their country and hate its traditions and history uh, because they're being given this uh, you know idea about the way Australia was founded and all of the rest of it and um, uh, I mean uh, when they come to university I suppose uh, they're going to have that uh, reinforced now aren't they because uh, again people are uh, reluctant to give them contrary views. 
Um, so I've forgotten what the question was, Sal, after going down the school road for a minute there. What was your initial point? Oh, <laughs> sorry. My, I was actually taking the opportunity of you talking to uh, look up the massacre maps, which are Michael Connor. And I do want to give full credit. Uh, Michael Connor was the author who's been uh, doggedly pursuing the massacre maps yeah. issue. Um, my point was actually uh, was actually uh, Christopher's point, and the question was, you know, can we count on the revolution to eat its children? Do we really have to do much about cancel culture other than wait for yeah. cancelers to cancel each other? Uh, well, I, 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 it's very hard to know. I mean, people keep asking me, when is all this going to change? And there's a very, another very interesting question from Christopher up the top there that I'm seeing. Where do the practitioners of cancel culture come right. from? Are they from the ranks of the economically privileged? Well, my theory on this, and I, though I didn't come up with it myself, I heard it from someone a few months ago, is that um, the elites, which we hear about now, I suppose they're the moneyed and the professional elites particularly, um, have found in cancel culture and in wokery um, this uh, a kind of religion substitute right. and uh, even to the extent perhaps of uh, uh, assuaging uh, guilt they might have about themselves being in a position of superiority and uh, right. authority and what have you and uh, all the rest of it and so it's uh, interesting to find uh, the, the ways in which the big end of town for example has uh, wholeheartedly embraced uh, wokery which is a uh, and I'm going to say it's the acceptable face of cancel culture. It doesn't, cancel culture doesn't have any acceptable face. But uh, outdoing one another in virtue signalling and halo polishing uh, with regard to all of the issues that get people cancelled. So um, I think this is one of the most challenging aspects of coming up against this because these are the people, you know, the 1%, if you like, or something like that, that hold all the, the purse strings and the power. And... Uh, um, um, it's been interesting for me in doing some HSC teaching to find that it's uh, usually the uh, youngsters from the uh, very well-to-do schools and well-to-do suburbs who are most on fire about uh, all of these issues of wokery and, and what have you. And uh, so it seems to me that it's uh, chic to be um, woke. Mm. And uh, therefore, this means it makes it all the more difficult to imagine how it's going to be turned around. I, I see it as a very, very Calvinist phenomenon, as as a as an an atheist Calvinism. It is yes, it's, it's an, as Barry Humphreys calls it a neo Puritanism. It, it yeah, just yeah, yeah. lacks the one aspect of Puritanism, and that is uh, not that they were ever very strong on this, but it lacks uh, forgiveness. <laughs> and I think it's no coincidence that in the U.S., you know, if you were to think of a center of this, it would be uh, you know in say Harvard University, right? That the, yeah. uh, the, the Puritan University, the, mm -hmm. the non, I mean, Harvard, remember for a couple hundred years was the nonconformist alternative to Oxford and Cambridge. You, mm -hmm. you couldn't get a university degree at Oxford and Cambridge unless you were an Anglican, mm -hmm. but you could go across the water and go to Harvard and get your nonconformist university degree mm -hmm. and be a nonconformist minister. Yeah. Uh, and, and I see this very much as part of the, not just Calvinist metaphorically, but yeah. Calvinist literally in the sense of the, the children, the, the, the same class of people and their children and their, their, their descendants who were once, well, who, and, and I, I use the word Calvinist instead of Puritan very specifically because it's an idea that the there is a group of people who are among the elect, the elect, and you, the and elect. you cannot through your good works mm. join mm. the elect. No, no, no. The elect and they're a minority, so they're an elite, and the rest are damned to everlasting perdition. And uh, that's the you know, that's at the heart of Calvinist teaching, isn't it? And so what you have in this uh, secular Calvinism, if you like, or secular Puritanism, is this sense of um, you know, of salvation through uh, virtue signaling and, you know, the holier, well, thou, the holier than thou attitude. Well, that's the brilliance of that term, virtue signaling, that the, the, you know, the whole idea behind Max Weber's product and work ethic thesis is that Calvinists wanted to signal that they were among the elect. Of course, no one knows who's among the elect. Only God knows who's among the elect. But you want people to think you're among the elect. <laughs> and, and there's, proof, you know, there's proof of it, too. 
because uh, uh, if, uh, as uh, Robert Lowell has in one of his poems, he has one of those Puritan whalers saying, if God had not been on our side, why the Atlantic would have swallowed us up quick. So material prosperity is a sign in Calvinist teaching right. and in that wasp tradition of the Northeast, as you well know, um, of, of God's favour. So again, this gels well with the elites in the, the non-religious sense, but in the pure, this, uh, this moral Puritanism, this woke Puritanism, um, uh, you know, they've done well in the world and uh, uh, that's a sign of um, their virtue and they can now uh, express that or I think in some ways apologise for it or assuage a certain guilt about it, perhaps by showing just how woke they are. And that problem would make a problem, wouldn't it? Uh, for the universities hmm. because, uh, and, we're, and you know much more, of course, about this than I do, so, uh, I mean, so much depends, doesn't it, in America on the alumni and the generosity right. of alumni and philanthropy and what have you. Well, if these people are going to be exercising their wokery in their donations to Harvard and Yale and Princeton and all the rest of it, um, I think Princeton has just cancelled its classics uh, department or something. Well, they didn't cancel classics. They got rid of Greek and Latin, Greek and Latin. <laughs> as a requirement for classics. Of because course, they're classicists. For, for white supremacy and slavery yeah. in 2000. What's hilarious is the classicists at Princeton, and it's been this big debate in classics. Um, uh, shout out uh, to our, our New Zealand colleague. I can't shout out if I'm going to blank on the name. I'm so, James, I'm so sorry, James, for forgetting, uh, you know, for writing about this. But the Princeton Classics Department and classicists in general who have gone through this period of angst about classicism being a white supremacist field, They've not argued that they should thus resign their jobs and be disbanded. <laughs> they believe they should keep their jobs, <laughs> because no one else should be allowed <laughs> to yeah. follow them into them. Yes. No, well, uh, this uh, irony has been brought out by uh, Simon Haynes of the Ramsey Centre with regard to English, because both Simon and I share that discipline. And uh, he's pointed out how, you know, the great works of English literature, many of them, particularly those from the past, have been cancelled. So it's not only people that are cancelled, it's books, of course, that are cancelled as well, as we're just saying about Greek and Latin. Um, and, uh, you know, these are the very people whose jobs and careers have uh, been uh, grounded in the appreciation of these things and often scholarship on them. Uh, and now they're progressively reduced to a smaller and smaller number of texts that can be studied. All of this was predicted donkey's years ago by Orwell in 1949, in 1984, the book, and uh, by Bradbury, as someone was reminding me the other day, in Fahrenheit uh, 451, whatever it is, to burn all the books. Uh, and uh, and so does Orwell, too, uh, see a time when uh, Milton and Shakespeare. Shakespeare clings on because he's infinitely malleable to uh, all kinds of uh, uh, I think he clings on because he's just too popular. <laughs> yeah, it's not, you, know, yeah. you, know, you know, you can end up with female leers and transsexual hamlets and all of the rest. I mean, Star Wars clings on and they just remake it and remake it, but in more and more wokish ways. But, you know, you, you, you can't get rid of Star Wars, but you can certainly remake it. Well, the next one is going to be a woman, isn't, isn't he, she, or maybe a uh, trans it, it, the, the, you know, it, it's, it, it, well... <laughs> you can do anything you want with the source material as long as it's popular. Yeah, right. But you see, from my point of view, uh, the saddest thing uh, and it's scandalous is just the way in which poetry has progressively mm. receded because it is that literary form that is least susceptible uh, to social engineering and what have you. So you know, the, some of the greatest poets are just no longer taught. John Milton, for example. Uh, and uh, that's because they don't conform to woke priorities. And uh, there's not only is it regrettable that the literature from the past has gone, but also this whole forgetting of the past and this uh, and, and not teaching people the importance of cultural context and everything. You know, the moment they see an unacceptable word, such as if I can go back to that novella again, The Nigger of the Narcissus, oh, well, that can't be, we, we mustn't read that, you know, and it, that must be hate speech and what have you. Uh, when that wasn't the intention at all. And we've just had uh, the uh, this uh, report from Canada, uh, which seems to be a, I don't know, one of the great centres of wokery, uh, that they've banned To Kill a Mockingbird because it's racist. Uh, they've banned, oh, what was the other one? I just can't think, uh, because it's sexist. I mean, The Handmaid's right. Tale. And right. something else has gone too, which is just... My 
my mind mode, and without recognizing that these works are critiques of those yeah. things. I mean, To Kill a Mockingbird is a great critique of right. racism. And right. Flannery O'Connor, that who I love, yeah. that wonderful Southern writer, um, she's been cancelled and at one of the universities in the South, and they interviewed some of the people who were favouring her cancellation, and these people said completely shamelessly they had they never read her. And anyone who's not going to read To Kill a Mockingbird, at least watch the Gregory Peck film. It's fantastic. Yes. Um, uh, one of my favorite N-word stories is during the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates between Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas about slavery in the territories. This is just before uh, the Civil War in the United States. Uh, uh, they were having this debate in Illinois. Uh, Stephen Douglas, who was um, advocating for respecting the southern states' not only right to have slavery, but their extension of slavery to the territories, consistently referred to African-Americans as Negroes. Abraham Lincoln in that debate, uh, who was trying to win over his white audience, consistently referred to African-Americans as N-words. I won't say it. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's really you know, just ironic that you know, Abraham Lincoln is the hero of the Lincoln-Douglas debates, but... Yeah. Uh, he's the one with the problematic language. Uh, Douglas wanted to be very officious and you know very formal, and he you know, yeah. and it was Lincoln who was trying to be, well, trying to be what he thought was, uh, you know, connecting with people. And well, well there yeah. you go. History won't. Uh, if yeah. history remembers it, they well, you can't you can't report you can't have students read the Lincoln Douglas debates anymore, not because of what Douglas said. Mm. But because of Lincoln, <laughs> yeah, that's irony. and the other another irony in that uh, domain is, of course, that in rap music, African Americans use the term all the time, and that's what these people who say, "Oh, well, that must be hate speech because you said that word," they are so selective in their outrage. I mean, that's yeah. not hate speech when you get that rap. Song. It's talismanic, you know, and that's what. Oh. That's why I come back to this Calvinist issue because it really is a symbol of who's among the elect, that is using the word or not using the word. Yeah. It, it doesn't matter what your actual opinions are. Mm. It, it, it's the symbolic value. Look, I, I do want to read a comment from Binary Agenda. Uh, Binary Agenda says, I don't have a lot of sympathy for TERFs, that's trans-exclusionary uh, radical feminists. They contributed significantly to the rise of cancel culture, but now cry foul when they are on the receiving end. Do you mm. think, Barry, that uh, you know, whether it's, it's feminists being targeted by transsexual activists, whether uh, it is, well, uh, gay rights groups uh, being targeted to some extent by transsexual activists. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's all about transsexuality, but you know, should, should people who believe in free speech be welcoming anyone to the party, no matter how late they are to the party? Or should there be uh, some kind of, you know, well, it's your problem. You're the one who let this get out of hand. No, it's a very, it's a very good point. And it's, uh, again, uh, ironic to see if you've been around as long as I <laughs> seem to have been around now in the academic world uh, to remember the very censorious sorts of people that one did encounter in the late 60s and 70s now complaining very vociferously about censoriousness. Uh, but but the difference is that though they did, uh, they were also, sounds like a paradox, but it was the case, and I could give examples, they were also great champions of freedom from censorship. So even though they could be very censorious, uh, and the right is as much in that camp as the left too, uh, they were fervently in favour, and this often, conservatives often found this objectionable, I found it pretty hard to take too, and I came up against words I'd never seen before, even on toilet walls in such as student newspapers and what have you. They were fervent in their defence, uh, and this was, when you look back on it, um, something to be admired of freedom from all censorship. So um, now, uh, ironically, uh, they've become uh, the, um, the victims of it. Hmm. Hmm. And they are being censored at every turn. Uh, no. So uh, it's, um, yes, it's, it's interesting. The school situation is um, 
uh, deeply worrying because um, you've got this nexus, haven't you, of course, between what happens at the universities and what's being taught at the universities right. and how it, uh, you know, the disciplines, particularly in our areas of the humanities and the social sciences, I say in that piece, and isn't this true, that uh, the universities will continue to flourish uh, in the terms of their professional faculties, medicine and law and engineering and vet and dentistry and all the rest of them will go on. Uh, but, I mean, the heart and soul of a university, I know the engineers don't like these statements, but the heart and soul of the university surely is, uh, the, uh, is the study of the humanities. And uh, once you... Uh, corrupt that, well then, you know, what's left of the university, really, other than a vocational training institution, however noble those vocations may be. And uh, I just feel that um, the attack on freedom of speech and freedom of thought goes to the heart of the study of uh, humanities, and um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a huge <laughs> problem. And I think, uh, going to what back, I hope to answer, in a way, one of the questions about where this will all lead is what we're actually seeing, and that is the shrinking of uh, humanities departments. Right. And uh, I wrote a piece donkey's years ago that uh, English was going the way of Latin and Greek. Uh, well, Latin right. and Greek is gone uh, in most places, hasn't right. it? Uh, and I think that that might happen. And funnily enough, I don't think it'd be a bad thing uh, because mm -hmm. then I think the rebuilding can begin. But uh, uh, you're so much younger than I am, Sal. So you'll need to see that rebuilding. <laughs> Judith Judith Brett, uh, I don't know if you know Judith Brett, she had a piece in the month last year called The Bin Fire of the Humanities. And all the, right. yeah. Um, yeah. you know, so, you know, and talking about uh, you know, strange bedfellows, different political views. I mean, I think a lot of people from, uh, well, uh, hopefully the, the, the disappearance of the humanities, hopefully, will concentrate minds on the reasons behind it. Uh, you know, on if you alienate, well, there's a lot of talk in, in, in the pop culture world about how Marvel movies, you know, since Disney took over Marvel, these are the superhero movies, they've become so preachy that nobody wants to, to come see Marvel yeah, movies anymore. Yeah, yeah. And they are digging their own graves. And of course, as private companies, there will be a correction because, you know, when they see no one's coming to movies and, mm, mm, mm. you know, Sony, which owns a little piece of Spider-Man, but enough to make its own Spider-Man movies, mm. Sony makes a Spider-Man movie and they make $2 billion. <laughs> you know, but Disney makes a Spider-Man movie and no one goes to see it mm. because it's so laden down with messaging mm. uh, that in the corporate world, okay, there will be a day of reckoning. Mm. And, you know, companies will change their behavior. But in universities, I really worry that humanities departments and closely following on their heels, social science departments will simply dig their own graves because it's not their grave they're digging. Mm. It's their successor's grave they're digging. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Well, I mean, this is anecdotal, of course, and from a small range of students, but my students that I've been teaching for the HSC over the last half dozen years or so, um, the, the, the best of them, the others wouldn't go near English or humanities studies at the universities. Anyhow, they're off to do science and med engineering and medicine, what have you. But the best of them who once you would have encouraged in the way of, you know, studying an arts degree and doing uh, English and what have you, uh, they all say you know, there's no way in the world that they, after what they've been through at school, uh, where they've encountered what my predecessor at uh, Quadrant Les Murray called, instead of English studies, they've encountered lying studies. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've had books that have, they've had to say uh, are wonderful, and I've said to them, do you really think this is wonderful? Do the other boys and girls in the class think this, is, this rubbish is wonderful? Oh, no, we all know it's rubbish, but we've got to say it's wonderful <laughs> because it's written by a fashionable minority group. And, um, you know, I mean, so they, you know, they're young enough, and, but they're mature enough at the same time to realise they're not going to give up a few years of their lives to this kind of thing. So they, they are digging their own graves, and this may be the way of them sort of beating one another up, which I think was uh, one of the gentleman's phrases there, yes, in those comments. Mm. Yeah. And, and I, I think no, I, that may be the creative future, actually, because why should people be denied their cultural and civilizational birthright, which includes uh, the poetry of Milton and the novels of Jane Austen and uh, and all of the rest of it. I mean, this is a rich and wonderful storehouse. And What's funny is it, 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 which I think, it, I think is a kind of child abuse myself. Sorry. Oh, so as I understand it, Jane Austen, this, this goes back to Star Wars and Shakespeare. 
as I understand it, Jane Austen has not gone away. She's just been reinterpreted. Yeah, well, that's right. Popular. Yes, the school Milton team. has gone away because, yeah. well, who wants to read hundreds of pages of poetry about God? Mm. Well, I, well, I, you know, well, well, obviously, <laughs> we could talk about Milton forever. But uh, uh, yes, uh, one of my students had to write a postscript uh, to or a rewriting of Jane Austen, uh, an improvement on Jane Austen. <laughs> thereby, um, Elizabeth Bennet uh, in Pride and Prejudice um, hooks up uh, with uh, Darby, not Darcy, and Darby is a, a transsexual lesbian. <laughs> and uh, uh, they go off uh, at the end of the novel and have a few sperm in the and live happily ever after. And, uh, uh, this is a um, this is an improvement improvement on Jane Austen and making uh, the novel acceptable for today. I I wish I could do Jane Austen impersonations because I'm just in my mind trying to imagine in her language yeah. <laughs> how she would describe <laughs> such a relationship. Oh, yes. What oh, euphemisms, well, I, you know, she would come up it with. It have to be a marriage broker of same-sex marriages and a transsexual wife, <laughs> I suppose. But, uh, you know, I mean, the, the fact is Jane Austen is actually a very conservative writer. I mean, her, her yeah, yeah. heteronormative marriage, don't they? Yeah. A lot of the books are just about finding a husband. That's that's the whole <laughs> point of the book of, of, of The Pride and Prejudice. Um, look, I, I know I've kept you... Far too long already, but I have to ask you about one final thing before we go, and that is Mr. Right. I should say, well, actually, I was going to say, are you still Professor Jordan Peterson? Apparently, he's American. Emeritus professor. Uh, I was going to say Mr. Jordan Peterson because he's been, he's left the university, but no, no, he's Emeritus Professor Jordan Peterson. Yes, well, I they, no they, longer they, they kicked him out, and then they conferred an Emeritus professorship on him. <laughs> well, I don't know if they kicked him out or maybe bribed him to leave, offering uh, to, to give. I, I don't know. No one knows the truth. No. But this um, this article is interesting because, you know, look, I look, if I were a, a millionaire pop intellectual, I, 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 I'm sorry, Mark Scott. I'd resign at the University of Sydney tomorrow because I just wouldn't want to have to, you know, process paperwork, go teach classes, deal with the results processing system, deal with, you know, the the, the Rex system that I can't remember what it stands for. The you, you know, I, I would think good riddance. I can you know, work on that. So I'm not sure how much I believe that the three reasons he resigned um, were not that he was now rich, but that uh, you know, first his graduate students couldn't get jobs. Uh, yeah. Second, his say I'm having a little few problems here because of too many things going on the computer. Uh, second, because of uh, ideology universities and uh, I think that's more graphic, central. That's more central to him. Yes, diversity yes. statements. Uh, and third, I, I don't remember what the third was. No, um, no. But uh, but what's what are your thoughts on Jordan Peterson and his uh, you know quasi forment? Uh, this whole this whole issue. Well, a number of friends of mine are great fans of his uh, and uh, listen to him on YouTube and read his material. I, 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 there must be something wrong with me here because I'm supposed to be a fellow traveller. I find it difficult to listen to. I, he doesn't have a very good turn of phrase. I suppose I've pro proved I haven't got a very good one in this interview either, but uh, I don't know enough about him. Isn't he a psychologist by training? He, he is, for, forgive me being very frank, an, an academically mediocre psychologist who hit it big in the self-help world with some fairly anodyne bits of traditional advice, um, you know, boys man up to become men, uh, kids uh, do better in families with two parents, uh, you know, nothing revolutionary, uh, but of course, within today's academy, absolutely radical yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. to, to, to say things like, you know, boys should show toughness is yeah. how dare you say that? And I was like, well, uh, people have been saying it for as long as we have literature, you yeah. know. A lot of his stuff, you know, seems to be a kind of an academic version of Dr. Phil, some of the things you see. Yeah, uh, very. Oh, he is, I think, very much a, a, a Dr. Phil who has a real PhD, <laughs> who has a real PhD and a real professorship. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm not very helpful on him, but I thought that was just useful. And the point about him is that millions, I think, 
well, listen to him and watch him. That's, you know, that is uh, our problem at Quadrant. I mean, we have a few thousand readers, most of whom I think agree with most of the things we say. Uh, Anthony Carr's asked a question there, uh, Sal, which is a very important one. Can yeah. you see that at the top? What, what is, is going on? on with the faculties of education at university? Well, we need another couple of hours on that. Uh, we have a couple hours if you want to stay. Uh, well, uh, just one aspect that I will mention in relation to that very good question, and it's a very important one with relation to schools in particular. What used to be the case was you did a degree in a subject. You majored in a subject, English, history, French, whatever it might have been. And then uh, you did a dip ed and you went and taught in the schools. And you might have even done an honours degree in English history or whatever it might have been. What's happened now more and more, that still does happen, although the dip has become an M ed in this, you know, zeal for higher credentials and what have you. What's happened now for many teachers is that they do it the B ed degree. They right. do a degree in education and they do uh, less of the component of the English or the history or the French or whatever it might be. And so uh, they've had less exposure to the discipline that they now find they are teaching full time in the school. So uh, that's one of the things, there are other things as well, but that's one of the things that's going on in faculties of education, which I think is uh, not good for the promotion of the disciplinarity. And then when you consider that the way in which the subjects like English and history are being taught in this kind of dog's breakfast smorgasbord way, do what you like and choose what you will and what have you, leave out two or three centuries and it doesn't matter in English studies, for example. Well, you know, you've got a recipe for a, a, a very watered down version of the subject in the schools. It's, a, it's almost a disaster, actually. And so that's one of the things that's going on in uh, faculties of education in relation to uh, uh, disciplinarity. You know, we hear that there's a shortage of teachers, that people don't want to go into education, that the minimum ATAR for education degrees is you know, 10 points lower than for any other degree at a university like the University of Sydney. And we always view this as, well, maybe the pay isn't enough in education, maybe the career opportunities aren't there. Is it possible that the problem is the education faculties themselves and that they're just not very attractive places to go to school. And, and I'm particularly thinking uh, at the Center for Penn Studies, Glenn Fay has been doing uh, research into the curriculum of the of teacher education, of initial teacher education. Mm. And it seems like such a warped curriculum. Uh, I mean, is it possible that our teacher shortage is really due to faculties of education just being so unpalatable that people don't want to study there? I, uh, that, that may well be uh, one of the reasons, and I think the, the issues surrounding the teaching profession too, and its standing in the community, uh, and uh, the, the fact now that uh, uh, and this is going to be a sexist statement, so I'm issuing a strong trigger warning now. I hope someone doesn't feel unsafe after this next sentence. Yes, block your ears. Uh, the retreat of men from education okay. has had all kinds of negative aspects too, and that's a statistical fact. Uh, well, because... and actually, there's a lot of sociology on this, not specifically with education, but with mm. uh, what are called uh, gender cues and the idea that as professions feminize, mm. it uh, now you can see this from a feminist standpoint or from a uh, you know from a neutral research standpoint. Yeah. Either way, you see it as professions feminize, they become lower prestige. Now you could say that's because there's a cause and effect problem here, an endogeneity problem here. Uh, are they becoming lower prestige so men going into them? Are they becoming lower prestige uh, because people are discriminating against women? And so as they see more women in a profession, they give it lower prestige. Um, there's a lot of problem here, but we there's a lot of difficulty in untangling what's happening here. Yes. But we do know that there's a connection between feminization and loss of prestige. And we yes. see that, for example, in pediatrics, mm. within medicine and general mm. practitioners, we see that probably no, up in mm. Yes, yes, and there's, there are all sorts of factors here. Uh, one of them being that any man who wants to teach particularly smaller children, you know, there's the prejudice that he must be a pedophile or something, otherwise why would he? I think, frankly, I, I would not advise anyone I cared about who's male to become a teacher because of the 
high risk that over the course of a 40 or 50 year career, even if they behave perfectly well, mm. there's just too much risk of, yeah. uh, 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 I mean, now, of course, we, you know, there are, and I sh we should be clear, um, sexual abuse in schools has been going on for a long time. It still goes on. It's a serious problem. Pedophiles in the younger grades, it's a serious problem among high school teachers seducing their students. Mm. Uh, you know, I don't want to minimize the, the, this fact, mm. but because of the fear that male, t I mean, when I was a, a new assistant professor at the University of Pittsburgh, I was initially not given uh, admission to what's called the graduate faculty. In, in most U.S. universities, you start as an assistant professor, but you're not allowed to supervise PhD students until you've been confirmed in a sense. And yeah, it, yeah. I was not confirmed as a member of the graduate faculty because my colleagues thought that it was unsafe to put me uh, in potential position of power over female students. Mm. Um, this simply because I was 33 years old and male. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no other reason. And this, as rich as it was, came from senior academics, almost all of whom were baby boomers married to their former graduate students. Yeah. <laughs> but what was good for the goose was, yeah. of course, not good for the gander. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so yeah. I mean, and one of the issues, too, which I was talking to a, a, a colleague earlier today about, uh, is the uh, way in which boys are doing so appallingly badly at school. And this isn't good for anybody, for men or women. Uh, they're, it's, uh, they're doing 50% worse, some global study has shown, in the areas of literacy, maths and science than girls. And, uh, I mean, I had some wonderful female teachers. I, I mean, I, I, all that matters is that the teacher is good, whether he is a he or she is a she, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. But nevertheless, uh, if there is such an obvious uh, idea developing that education is women's business and mm -hmm. it's a sissy thing and what have you, well, right. that's not going to help boys any more than the other side of the coin is good either, that it's a kind of education success is, is a male thing. There should be equity uh, and there isn't at the moment uh, in this way that the pendulum swung now to the feminization, which is an unfortunate term. I don't like it much of education, but uh, certainly uh, the majority of teachers now are female. What is it? Something like 90% of New South Wales boys go through primary school without seeing a man in the classroom. Mm. Well, that has an effect. That has an influence on them. And uh, yeah. uh, it's not surprising that they're generally not doing as well as they used to do. And, um, it's well, another big issue, and it's something I don't know that faculties of education would necessarily want to go near because then they'd be accused of being sexist. Well, I want to thank our audience for staying with us this long. I also want to apologize to Michael Connor. Michael, I am going to put a link to your work in Quadrant on the genocide massacre maps, rather, uh, just as a, a pointer to anyone who might want to to have a look at them. They've been fantastic, fantastic work. I've really enjoyed reading it. Um, Barry, I do want to end on a positive note. And so I'm going to put you on the spot here. Can you recommend a poem? And please don't say Paradise Lost. <laughs> recommend a poem that all of us, myself included, but uh, everyone listening, uh, should read today. Uh, I am tempted to say the Wasteland by T.S. Eliot, but uh, I think uh, people's uh, hearts would sink if I said that, mainly because it's the centenary year of it and I'm in the middle of writing an essay about it, T.S. Eliot's great poem. Oh, let me think what would be a good poem to read to lift. We need to have our... The Wasteland's nice and short. Yes, I, uh, the, some of the best poems, unfortunately, are about unhappy things. I mean, I love Stevie Smith, the English uh, woman poet, and uh, she has one called Not Waving But Drowning, which is also rather depressing. But um, let me try, I'm trying to think of something positive. It was funny, the other day I was talking to a Year 12 student and she had to do a comprehension and there was a poem that was very upbeat and happy. And she said, do you know, she said, that's the first piece of literature that was <laughs> affirming that I've read in several months. And, I, and so much of what we give them is, you know, miserable and uh, full of anguish and, you know, clothing and what have you. Oh, I'll go. I'm reading a wonderful biography uh, by Julia Parker of Wordsworth, so I'll go to, back to good old Wordsworth and say, daffodils, I want to <laughs> cloud.
<laughs> All right. That's the deals it is. I'll also put a link to that in the description. Uh, I'll sure it's online. Barry Spur, thanks for joining us today. Much appreciated. Thank you. I loved every minute. <laughs> All right. Take care. And uh, we'll see you next week on the Professor's Podcast. Bye.